I'd like to thank everyone who uh, came out for the demonstration today. I think it's very important, as we all do, that we continue to show our opposition to what all of us here know to be an unlawful and unjust war, uh, a war which harks back to the colonial times when Afghanistan was, uh, was of course, uh, invaded by British and uh, many other foreign countries over the time. I guess I don't want to say too much. I think the speakers who came in front of me were very eloquent and went through most of the points that concern me as well. So I'll just address myself fairly briefly to a couple of points um, and then maybe open it up for anyone who wants to discuss these things. I guess my overall feeling about the issues of Afghanistan is as an anti-war movement, we have a lot of work to do. There's no doubt about that because right now we are being bombarded by an almost unprecedented barrage of propaganda and publicity by the military and by the government, probably which Canadians haven't seen since the Korean War for the most part. Um, there's no question that the so-called military mission in Afghanistan is a disaster, indeed it was from the beginning and will be until our troops are withdrawn either honourably or dishonourably, as will be the case. It was a, a war which should never have taken place, which was actually never justified in terms of the United Nations Charter. The Americans claim that uh, they went in under Article 51, which provides for self-defence of nations, but this is an article which is only applied to other states invading other states. It's not intended to be used against uh, terrorist actions, when normal criminal prosecution and international police investigations would normally have been, been applied. To use one example, when the Israeli government bombed Tunis in 1985 to try to kill uh, Arafat, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution of condemnation 14 to 0. The United States abstained. And they passed the resolution because Israel was not perceived to have any right to attack another country simply because a group to which it was opposed, the PLO, happened at that time because they had been kicked out uh, of Jordan um, to be actually um, uh, settled at that point. Israel was condemned. The United States has done essentially the same thing. They invaded Afghanistan because they claimed the Taliban would not give up uh, Osama bin Laden, but what the news never tells us is that the Taliban were prepared to negotiate uh, uh, Osama bin Laden, first of all to be transferred to another court in Peshawar in Pakistan, and Osama bin Laden apparently was in agreement with that. And this is documented in at least the European newspapers at the time. In fact, the Taliban was trying to negotiate with the United States for the surrender of Osama bin Laden back in 1995 for the bombings of the embassies in Tanzania and Kenya, and then in 1996 for the, the bombing of the USS Cole. But the US refused to negotiate and didn't go through any extradition procedures. So this is an unlawful war right from the start. And the myth that this is supported by the United Nations can actually be shown to be demonstrably false. This was a NATO action inspired by Articles 5 and 6 of NATO, which are very war friendly, of course they are because NATO is controlled by the United States. Its central military command is under the command of United States military commanders. So right now it seems to me that we are being bombarded both by the military and the government by unprecedented propaganda and unfortunately also by the mass media of communication including the CBC. When CBC puts on its shows with Peter Mansbridge behind the lines, we see what Canadian soldiers are going through, but we never, real, we never get to hear the real news that scores and scores of innocent children, uh, women, children and males, innocent civilians are actually being murdered by ISAF troops. And I just, I don't, I don't want to read a speech, but there's one thing I would like to do, because you won't get it from anywhere else. I would like to read you a couple of examples of villages which were bombed by NATO and US forces and the numbers of people who were actually killed.
So we know in July the 5th, and this is the Guardian newspaper and BBC correspondents, went to the village of Chachal in the north northeast province of Kuna and found that over 60 people had been, innocent civilians had been killed by NATO troops. In July 2006, the village of Tarin Kaut, again, uh, over 60 civilians had been killed. In 2007, April the 29th, 27th to the 29th, in the district of Shinand, about 50, 51 to 55 civilians were killed, and so on and so forth. And after the Shinand uh, disaster, Hamid Karzai himself wept openly at a news conference and tried to disassociate himself from uh, the actions of the NATO uh, and, the, and the US forces. So part of our problem, I think, is that this is the news which isn't being reported. When I think back to 1972, from my hometown in Northern Ireland, the second battalion of the parachute regiment murdered 14 innocent civilians in a demonstration much like this. And the reverberations of those killings continue even till this day. That the hatred and resentment of the people of Derry will take, I suppose, generations. But this was 14 people. We're talking in Afghanistan about 60 people, 50 people. And over the course of a six-month period, we're talking of hundreds of innocent civilians who have been killed. And Peter Mansbridge takes us behind the lines not to tell us about these facts of the war, but to show us the complications and problems for Canadian soldiers. It's disgusting, and we have to do something about that. So my concern then... For the, for, for the future uh, of the reputation of this country is that there are so many misconceptions, disinformation and lies which are being spread and we need an alternative source of news and social action to try in the best ways we can to break down this and to expose the Canadian public to what are the real facts. People here already have talked a little bit about the humanitarian assistance and I'm not going to say too much about that except the Sendless Council in August of this year went to Afghanistan and looked for some of the CEDA projects which supposedly our government is funding and could not find a great many of them. Couldn't even find them. Another, another to show you the example of how aid is used in Afghanistan, a good example from US aid, which is the, the American version of CEDA, and this is reported in a very fine book by an American journalist who worked for an NGO called Ann Jones, and the book is called Kabul in Winter. And she was there during the time that the Kabul-Kandahar Highway, there were bids being put for the construction of a new highway between these two cities. And some of the bids which came in from European countries, the highest bid suggested it would, be, it would cost about $250,000 per kilometer to build this highway. But USAID finally decided to hire a US company called Lewis Berger. And Lewis Berger said that it could build a highway for $750,000 per kilometer. It got the contract because USAID, like Canadian companies, tend always to give preference to their own companies and their own firms. The highway was finally built for a million dollars per mile. And to add insult to injury, the Americans then imposed a $20 um, poll tax or a toll to use the highway, paid $20 per month for ordinary Afghanis, for whom $20 is a huge amount of money. So when we talk about foreign aid, we're talking, in a sense, about a shell game, to use Senlis's example. We're talking about the pretense of funding certain projects which independent agencies have great difficulty tracing and finding evidence for. But we know in the American case, and I suspect the Canadian case, that much of the funds designated for humanitarian assistance end up by going to military purposes. 80, 90 percent of American, of, of Canadian aid, as already a speaker said, goes to military purposes. So these are these are troubling statistics, to put it mildly. This is part of the con job that the government is, is actually doing. When we talk about civilian casualties, in a sense, we get into a very, a very bad area indeed, because 
for every civilian killed, there is supposed to be uh, a payment made by the governments involved of $2,000. So one Afghani life is equivalent to $2,000. The British and the Americans are known not actually to pay those sums. The difference between many of the, the bombing raids, um, because many of these civilians are killed through aerial strikes called in, often by Canadian or British forces, the American uh, are largely responsible for the aerial strikes. These are the strikes which cause most of the damage. The difference often is that the Americans go in without warning and the NATO troops provide 24 hours warning before ground troops actually go into villages. What happens when Canadian forces go into villages where there are suspected terrorists? Once they get into the village, because they're so concerned that houses and farmhouses and places like that are booby-trapped, they resort to a scorch-earth policy. Everything is destroyed. They leave the village totally destroyed. That's why there are so many displaced refugees, internally displaced refugees in Afghanistan. We are, in a sense, contributing to a scorched earth policy in Afghanistan as well. This is something that the news doesn't tell us. So I guess my concern is the news and the propaganda are building an image which is totally unrelated to the truth in Afghanistan. In addition to that, the government, in a sense, is trying through a number of ways to convince Canadians to go with this mission and not to oppose it. The most important way, I, well, one of the ways they do this is through fear. It's through creating a fear, which is often a racist fear, that uh, Islamic uh, is fundamentalist and by implication radical Islam in general is something to be feared, much like the communists were supposed to be feared before. And in this country we have a long history, unfortunately, of of racializing uh, certain groups, uh, of vilifying and demonizing them, whether it was the Chinese and the opium or the Ukrainians with the, the so-called communist threats way back in the 1930s. Today, it's Muslims. And I, I was struck by the fact, and one of the speakers said quite rightly, that, that Harper has identified himself. He walks in lockstep with George Bush all the time. If Tony Blair was George Bush's poodle, as they said in Britain, then surely Harper is his ventriloquist doll sitting on his knees. Why do we say that? Because Harper, without flinching and without thinking, supported those barbarous attacks on Lebanon with all of that involved. Harper, without flinching or thinking, helped to sabotage the Palestinian Legislative Council's elections. Uh, Hamas won fair and square. Jimmy Carter was there uh, and his organization which monitors fair elections and Carter says there was no intimidation, there was no fraudulent ballot rigging as far as their normal standards were concerned. And yet in lockstep with George Bush, of course, Harper decides he's going to contribute to the sabotage of the Palestinian Authority with all of the misery and poverty that that uh, involves. More recently, Harper has set up um, a committee to look into Afghanistan. Does that remind anybody of the so-called Baker-Halliburton Committee, which Bush set up to look, in, look at uh, Iraq? And when it came back to Bush with suggestions that he didn't like, such as negotiate with Iran and negotiate with Syria and, and pull back, demilitarize some of your operations, Bush just walked straight over it much as I suspect Harper will walk straight over it. So we have a government which is tied tooth and nail to the American government. We have a government which claims in Afghanistan it's operating what they call a 3D policy, diplomacy, defense and development. How many people realize that this policy was first enunciated in 1997 at the National Press Council in Washington by none other than the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Marine Corps, except he referred to it as three-block war. We now have to start a three-block war on three different fronts, development, diplomacy, and, and defense. So again, it's no accident that General Rick Hillier was trained by the United States Marine Corps. We are becoming more and more integrated every day with with, an, uh, with the globalization of NATO, which if we go back to the 
the project for the new American century developed by the Bush government. We are becoming part of the Bush doctrine. Develop a global force for preemptive strikes in trouble spots across the world. And don't think that Iraq and Afghanistan is the last, or Haiti is the last. Next it may, could be Venezuela. Next it could be some socialist South American country which endangers long-term American oil security. So I won't go on like this, but I have lots of concerns about our violation of our international rights of torture, of our collaboration with rogue armies which are using unlawful weapons such as depleted uranium, uh, such as thermobaric, horrific weapons, space-age weapons, which the Americans have tested in Afghanistan, much like the Nazis tested their weapons in the Spanish Civil War. And I make no, no defense about making those parallels. I think they are legitimate. So in conclusion, I would say there are some important tasks facing the anti-war movement, and we have to take them seriously. It would seem to me we have at least two broad strategic tasks. One is to broaden the struggle. And by broaden, I mean bring in increasing number of groups and individuals. We have to appeal more to youth groups, to women's groups, to groups, faith-based and religious groups. We have to appeal to the labor, or labor movement. It was this year, if I'm not mistaken, in October, that the Canadian, Union, the Canadian Union of Public Employees had a national convention at which it demanded the immediate withdrawal of Canadian forces from Afghanistan. This is a, a very inspiring example. We need to extend this. We need to bring more and more groups into, into, into our zone of struggle here. And besides broadening the struggle, I think maybe more controversially, we have to deepen the struggle. Demonstrations is certainly one way to get our message out, but we have to increase the way in which we struggle against this un unjust war. We have to write petitions. We have to deliver those positions and, lo and lobby politicians. Laurie Horn, who is a local MP, a Tory MP, has just become parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Defence. And he's right here. At last we have a target oh, to engage. At last we have some place, we don't have a US Embassy, uh, we don't have uh, Millhaven Penitentiary where people are locked up on security certificates, but we do have a parliamentary secretary who will deputise in the House of Commons for Peter McKay when he's not there. We should petition, we should perhaps get involved in counter-recruitment, more controversial, but we should go down to the military recruiting centres and we should leaflet these places and we should try to persuade people who see no other future for themselves other than going to Afghanistan, that this is no future at all. So I would say in conclusion, there are three challenges that the government has thrown at us. The first is fear. And we can dissolve the fear by engaging in a community action with those people who the government is trying to target and demonize. They are part. They are part of our movement. The second, uh, the second great challenge that the government throws is is misinformation and ignorance. And that we can only struggle by research, and by investigation, and by putting out our own alternative media sources. But the third, the third challenge is the greatest one of all, and that is indifference. And that is those sections of the Canadian public who as yet have not come to a point of seeing this as an immediate moral, political, uh, and social issue. And as far as indifference is concerned, the only way to deal with that is through action, which we have today. Thank you.